Well, thank you very much. Book of Joel. Wow, what a book. Book of Joel. Where are we in the book of Joel is what we've been covering and where we are today. And I want to try to, to lead us uh, into the uh, major, the main idea of the book of Joel. We've been speaking about the day of the Lord and what does the day of the Lord mean. And the goal of, uh, we all understand that the Bible is an incredible history book right? It speaks about what's happened in the past, kind of what's going on now, and what will be happening in the future. So it is, an inc- it is just an incredible supernatural book. But even though it talks about the past, present, and future, God's wanting us to get something else. You know, it's the, um, we got all different kinds of denominations and in the Christian faith, and and I direct this statement in our Christian community, there are all, everybody tends to major on something different. And if you uh, study the theology of each path of the scripture, one is is into a method of, of Christianity, and there's just, and some's just into the, totally the spirit side of the, of the Christianity. And, but here we got all these different denominations about this book, and they're all a little bit different ways to approach the book. Now, here's what's so amazing to me. Each pathway makes sense. If you study covenant theology, you'll think, well, all that book is about is covenant. You can study any, any type of theologies, and when you go that pathway, they all seem like, well, this has got to be it, because the path works. But I submit to you, if all of these different paths work, it's not that one is, it's not that the Baptists are, have it more right than the Methodists or the Presbyterian, or the, it's not that somebody has it more right. It's just that everybody tends to major on their majors, but it still is a pathway in this book. And it works. The systematic theology of the way to approach, it works. So consequently, though, everybody with your system of theology, we think, well, this is the right one. Everybody's just a little bit off, right? They're close, but they're just a little bit off. But the truth is they all work. Why would God write a book that all of these different thought patterns would work? Or could it be that God's after something bigger than the thought pattern? Because we want to take the knowledge and the way we, our systems of theology and how we approach the book, and and we want to come up with this idea of this is what the book means. But yet there's thousands of different pathways in in Christendom and they're not wrong. It's just that they t- everybody tends to emphasize one particular path. Well, the book of Joel is addressing what I'm talking about here. The book of Joel is speaking to the main thing that God's after. Now, keep that in mind as we move forward and see if you can catch this. Now, we'll call this Lesson 7. It's also... In this series of Unlocking the Prophetic, I think, 100 and Lesson 109, I think it is. Now, we've been speaking about the day of the Lord. I want to bring us uh, up to speed of trying to capture what it is that God's saying through the prophet Joel. Now, this is the focus of chapters 1 and 2. We've done this, but I've got to bring us up to date to move forward Uh, The prophets saw in the past events that they were pointing to a future time when God will defeat uh, evil and will save his people uh, in the the whole world. Now, in understanding of the day of the Lord, in Genesis, God created the world and gives man power to rule over it. Now, this is very important in the book of Joel, and it's also very important to keep the big picture in mind as we're approaching the book of Joel. 
God gave man power in the book of Genesis over the creation. Now, man is tempted by Satan. There again, this is important in the book of Joel. Man is tempted by Satan. Are we still tempted by Satan? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, if we're still tempted by Satan, does, do you not think that we still have power given to us in the garden by God? You can't have it one way and not, not the other. Of course he has. Well, it must be, if that's the case, it must be a power that I don't understand. Because I believe the truth that God's given us power in this world. But for some reason, could we be understanding it properly? He offers them a promise that they could define good and evil on their own terms and that they would in turn uh, put themselves in God's, God's place. This is what happened with the serpent. He said, okay, I'm going to put in your hands the authority to, divide, to, to, to decipher, to define good and evil. Man, so it so happens every day of your life, all of us are going through a life discerning good and evil. Now, the day of the Lord comes upon Israel, and they are conquered and taken captive into exile. We know this happened in Babylon. Babylon came, took siege in Jerusalem. In the book of Joel, he's speaking about times past, the exile. With the Babylon comes against the nation Israel. Now, I, I want you to really grab this. Babylon is the symbol, is the prophetic symbol. Babylon is the prophetic symbol that's used throughout the scriptures. Why? Because in Babylon, God gave man power over this. Then man decided he wanted to define good and evil. And then what happens with Noah's children? They all went and they created this city called Babylon. Babel. And so when we understand that they came together, the first thing they wanted to do was build this structure towards heaven. What were they saying? They were like God. So therefore they were redefining good and evil. When you go to the book of Daniel, go to the book of Revelation, all of a sudden Babylon is, is an issue. Babylon is what everything's compared to. Joel kind of indirectly is referring to that. <clears throat> the idea is we like to say that Babylon is just, you know, sinful. Well, it's true. But it's a symbol of defining, redefining good and evil. So therefore, God sent a language to Babylon, languages, and it stopped them. What, what does all of these languages, what did happen? It caused mass confusion. Does anybody notice in the earth today that there's just mass confusion? And man's still trying to figure it out? I couldn't help but think of it. This week I saw on the internet they got a little device about like this and you can speak into it, and it'll translate it in any language, and it'll say it for you. Has anybody seen that one? And they just kind of thought, boy, they'd like to have that in Babylon. <laughs> and because, because there was this, was this mass confusion, and that mass confusion is still here. Understand now, God's the one that created all the languages. Because he wanted to confuse mankind that they could not be in unity. The languages to Babylon were a governing factor of the spirit. You, you know what a set of governors is on an engine? A, a set of governors is what keeps an engine from running too fast. It governs the engine. Well, what's governed mankind today is languages. Different languages. It has governed Mankind from coming into more, no more unity than we are this day. So we see all this confusion. 
we see that mankind's trying to bring peace to the earth. God says, no, I'm going to keep you confused. So do you think that peace is going to be able to be accomplished? When God says, I can't have you in unity in the state you're in. Right? right? So we have this, there's not but one place that we can come together in unity, and that's the church of Jesus Christ. So Satan tries to have us all say in a different language. Well, I'm a Methodist. I'm Presbyterian. Well, I'm that. Well, I believe it's the. I believe we're going to go through tribulation. I don't. Believe, I believe in rapture. I don't believe in rapture. Got all these languages. Could it be that God is some, after something bigger than the languages? Than us all saying the same thing. Could it be? What we start to learn, and I've I've, I've shared this with you before. God had a message to mankind, and that message, his first message, was the Ten Commandments. Mankind could not feel God's message, his first message. So God himself fulfilled his first message through Jesus Christ. We failed at his message. God fulfilled his message of the Ten Commandments. Jesus Christ fulfilled them. Here's the point. The point is... God loved His creation more than His own message. Can anybody hear what I'm trying to tell you? God loved mankind more than His own message of the Ten Commandments. So God had a greater message. Where we come together in the unity of the love of God is that our love for each other is greater than our message. I know that might have warped you just a little bit, and I hope it did. Because we've got to get it. If your love for mankind's not greater than your message, you don't need to give anybody a message. You're going to look like you're religious. It's not going to be received. The only way the truth of God can be received if it's given on a saltine cracker of the love of God. You got It's got to be palatable. You've got to be able to swallow it and eat it and take it in. And it's the love of God that the enemy tries to stop from operating. It is God's secret. It's the love of God. So we, we want to be right instead of righteous. You've heard that terminology. We want to be right all the time. I'm just telling you there's something greater than being right. That's right. There's something greater than being right. It's called the love of God. Why is that important? Because it's in the love of God that the kingdom of God becomes supernatural. God cannot allow His kingdom to be supernatural outside of our love being greater than our message. He can't turn us loose with such power. Can somebody hear what I'm trying to say? He cannot turn us loose with such power when our love is not greater than the message. Now, am I for our messages? Am I for teaching? Yeah, I'm for all of that. But please hear me. There's a lot of areas I don't agree with myself a year ago. Right? We're all changing. We're, We're growing. So I don't agree with myself a year ago in a lot of areas. So how in the world are we all going to agree with each other? And that's our, what we require before we're going to be in unity. God help us, somebody. We've got to allow each other to grow in our training and in our learning. Just so happens somebody might have a revelation you don't have. It might even be somebody's operating under a false revelation. But because God has promised you a promise, He's going to work it out in you. I'm not worried about people not thinking right or believing right in the world. It doesn't worry me in the least. I'm worried about me because he's wearing me out on where he's trying to change me to get in line with his word and his message. Don't worry about everybody. Listen, believing theology, doctrine incorrectly doesn't keep you out of heaven. (laughs) 
Now, if, if, if we believe it incorrectly, it might make it a little hard here on earth, but it doesn't keep you out of heaven. The only thing that keeps you out of heaven is if you don't receive God's love, through, which is greater than His message, which is through His Son, Jesus Christ. So we get confused sometimes. But the reason we need to be, this is important, is because the love of God is what the supernatural kingdom of God, it's the river that it rides on. Are, are you with me? Wow, that's my introduction. I need to move it here. Okay. <clears throat> here we see one by one Israel is ruled by oppressive empires. Now God uses the nation Israel to teach us and everybody about how mankind responds to God. God's not picking on Israel. God just tells stories. He's, uses, he's used probably you in your life, made a story out of your life for you to give your story to others. God uses the nation Israel to give us this storyline through the Scripture. But what He's showing us is our hearts, the hearts of mankind. So therefore, Israel, it represents us all. Now, the day of the Lord comes upon Israel. It's including the oppressive uh, empire of Rome that Jesus was born into. So here Jesus comes on the scene. He's born in Rome, is ruling over Jerusalem. Jesus was born into this situation. The nation Israel has been given these promises of land. If you, if you look in your Bible in Matthew chapter 1, it gives the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And it says that it's because of the covenant, the Davidic covenant and the Abrahamic covenant. It's a covenant that God made to Abraham, which is about what? Land. God made a promise to Abraham about land and his seed on the land. God made a promise to David that there would be a king ruling and reigning over that land that he promised. So Matthew chapter 1 opens up with these genealogies of Jesus from Abraham and from David. And the reason is that whole Old Testament is about basically those two covenants, Abrahamic and Davidic. Land, Abraham, king on, sitting on the land is who Jesus came to be. Now we see that he was born, though, in this thing of Rome. <clears throat> Something happened. Jesus didn't come to defeat the Roman Empire, even though the twelve and everybody thought, well, Jesus is ready to sit on that throne, fulfilling the divinic covenant over the land which he promised Abraham. But Jesus came on the scene, God sent Jesus on the scene, because something had to be put in line and in order before Jesus would sit on the throne. So because God's love was greater than His message of the Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant, the Ten Commandments, God had something in His heart, and that was that He loved mankind more than all of it. So Jesus comes. He's born into this uh, oppression of Rome. Jesus came to conquer the issue within man, the issue within man. That issue as God's created us, give us this authority to rule and to reign. <clears throat> then we had the fall of man. All of a sudden, man wanted to redefine good and evil. Well, only God can define good and evil. So the dilemma is man's acting like he's God. Can anybody hear that? If your love is greater than your message, your message is you're trying to act like you are God. Say, oh me. Are you with me? Your love has to be greater than your message or your me you're trying to read, you're defining good and evil into somebody's life. And God says you can only do that with my good and evil and with my love. So here we go. The sin that uh, exists within man that had been leading mankind astray uh, since Genesis 3. To defeat this sin within, Jesus took on the full power of sin and evil when He died on the cross. In this, Jesus gave His followers power over sin and death through the forgiveness that He offered. Now, the forgiveness of sin is a big deal. It is a big issue. The idea is God's trying to get us out of our dilemma of being gods. Are you with me? He's trying to save us from this dilemma we're in of redefining good and evil. So the issue and the problem is redefining 
good and evil. <clears throat> when Jesus defeated evil, he opened up a new way to escape Babylon. Babylon's a symbol. Babylon's the issue. And here's what happens. When you find yourself trying to speak the same language of the world, you're operating out of the spirit of Babylon. That's right. Say, Alan, I appreciate that. Can you hear me? Yes. When we want to speak in the language of the world, we're redefining that. Now, here we go. Now, it says this in Romans 7, 15. And if y'all don't mind, I'm going to move pretty quickly. Is that all right? It says this in Romans 7, 15. For what I am doing, I do not understand. Who said that? Paul. For what I will do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. Anybody felt this one? If then I do what I will not uh, to do, I agree with the law that is good. But now it is no longer I who does it, does it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will do, I do not do, but the evil uh, I will not do that I practice. And now if I do what I will not do, it is no longer I does it, but it sin dwells in me. Y'all got it? Yep. <laughs> you got it? <laughs> Paul was saying that we're in a mess. Right. He just will to do good and I can't. And I'm going to give you the answer to that one if you'll let me move quickly. Here we go. Let me ask you this. Can somebody tell me who that is? I know he's not your first cousin nor your third cousin. Okay, let's try this. Robert Louis Stevenson. Can somebody tell me he's a great author? Can somebody tell me what's something that he wrote? A what? Treasure Island, that's exactly right. One of his famous uh, writings. Treasure Island, everybody remember Treasure Island. Uh, let, let me see if you remember this one. Anybody can you tell me what that book is? Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Now that book is about Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is this guy and there was a, all this stuff was happening in the town so he, he went to uh, uh, Dr. Jekyll and trying to find this person that was causing it. This, it was murder and all kinds of stuff. He was wanting him to help him find him. Only to find out that Dr. Jekyll was Mr. Hyde. What he would do, Dr. Jekyll would take his potion in the book. He'd take his potion and he'd turn in to Hyde. What, what was he doing? What the book was, the writer was saying here, he was trying to congregate all of the evil of himself into this one person or personality. And so when he was Dr. Jekyll, he was great. He was just, just perfect. So he would take this potion, turn into hide so he could just work out his evil. <coughs> then that wear off, then he was Dr. Jekyll. That's what Paul was saying. The Apostle Paul was saying, I'm Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. There's part of me evil and there's part of me good. Has anybody got a witness what I'm trying to tell you here? I know I'm going to an extreme, but we got to get it. We all have that Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde in us. Then what happened in the book, he quit taking the potion and he still turned into Hyde. You say, well, I, well, it's not me. I don't have the potion. The other problem is he quit taking it. Mr. Hyde was still there. Right. And then he started doing, he murdered and some other things. Point being, the Apostle Paul was saying the same thing. Right. So we find ourselves, whether you want to admit it or not, we're in a dilemma. Right. You say, well, I've been saved. I've been born again. Well, I have too, but you still got a Dr. Jekyll and a Mr. Hyde. <laughs> You just have. I'm sorry if that hurt your feelings, but that's the reason I started this off with Scripture. <laughs> so here we see this. Now keep this thought in mind. Jesus knew this. God knows this. That's right. He knows it. He wants. Jesus said He came to set you free to Mr. Hyde. Well, I might be paraphrasing a little bit. 
That's what he's saying. I have set you free for Mr. Hyde. This is a big deal. Big message. Now, we all have this mixture. God uses the nation of Israel to show us this mixture in mankind and man's dilemma. Now, we see in the book of Joel, you say, well, Alan, what's <laughs> Dr. Jekyll and I got to do with Joel? It's got everything to do with Joel. Because he's comparing this in the day of the Lord, what's going to happen here? <clears throat> so the day of the Lord is an invitation to resist the culture of Abraham. Now in Genesis or in chapters one and two, <clears throat> the theme is of God defeating evil and saving the world. Go with me here. Joel makes an announcement of a disaster. Chapter one. Chapter one focuses on the past day of the Lord, and we've went over that. The plagues. Israel was in Egypt, you know the story. All the plagues happened, they come through, then they walk through the Red Sea, get on the other side, they make an altar, and they sing a song. God's showing us something here. God called Pharaoh to humble himself and acknowledge that God is his authority and that he cannot redefine good and evil on Egyptian terms. Every one of us have a little Pharaoh. His name's called Hyde. <laughs> <laughs> we we, we got to grab this thing. We got to face it. We got to look and see ourselves in the mirror here. If we're wanting to move in this true love of God, you can't make the love of God. You can't say, okay, I'm going to have the love of God. And then all of a sudden you are. It, it, it doesn't work that way. I'm, but I am going to show you how it works, hopefully. Pharaoh had a heart problem. He had a heart problem. Pharaoh is what happens when an entire nation redefines good and evil apart from God. Now, chapter 1, Joel calls on the elders and priests to lead people in repentance and pray. <coughs> repentance always precedes an outpouring of the Spirit. Thank you so much. Repentance always precedes an outpouring of the Spirit. Because in Joel, Joel chapter 2, we read some of it last week, where there's an outpouring of the Spirit. Everybody knows this, the Scripture. Where they have the outpouring of the Spirit, what well, we don't realize that in Joel chapter 1, before Joel chapter 2, one comes before 2, Joel saying, hey priest, hey Israel, you got to repent. That's right. You have got to repent. <clears throat> With no repentance, there is no outpouring. Amen. With no repentance, there is not outpouring. So if you want a touch of God, I just told you how you get it. You got to repent of something first. Precedes an outpouring. You don't get so spiritual, you get an outpouring. That's right. It goes the other way. You realize you're such a sinner, God's going to give you an outpouring. That's, right. That's what happens. Now here we go. You're desperate. Then Joel himself repents with the priest. That's what happens in the first of Joel. Chapter 2 is another day of the Lord. Move into the next one. Joel announces another day of the Lord that is future and not past. He speaks of coming disaster for Jerusalem. <coughs> and this coming disaster in Israel going into captivity, people call that the wrath of God. I call it the love of God. God loves us too much to let us stay in our stupid state. Yeah. Can anybody hear that? Yeah. He, he, it's the love of God. And He loves you too. He knows you're not... He, with Pharaoh, five times... Pharaoh, come on, get, get over it, buddy. Get a, God, yes, he hardened Pharaoh's heart, but not until time six. God, hate, God <clears throat> hardened Pharaoh's heart. He didn't give him a chance to repent on number six. Then number seven, he said, all right, Pharaoh, let's try it again. He did, he did do it again. <clears throat> so you got to understand that God loves us too much to let us continue. So therefore, things happen. God's Spirit is then poured out, we see, in Joel 2. And it goes like this. And I got to move quickly. It says, It shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. You know the Scripture. Your young men shall see visions. And also my men's, uh, men's servants 
on my maid servants. I will pour out my spirit in those days, and I will show wonders in heaven and in earth, and blood and fire and pillars of smoke. Before this happened, though, was repentance. Make no mistake. Now, <coughs> now we're coming to Acts 2. That was Joel 2. Now, in Acts 2, it's the same thing. Acts 2 is Joel 2. And we see it here. Day of Pentecost fully come. They were all one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. Now, here's what happens. is the church houses of America and of the world. As repentance takes place, there will be an outpouring of His Spirit. <clears throat> because we're right in the middle of this verse. Amen. God has promised us Joel 2. But Joel 2 doesn't come until we live through Joel 1. Here, and here he goes. Watch this one. He goes on to say this. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is on the third day, the third hour of the day. But this is that spoken by the prophet Joel. You see it? So here's Joel, and we got the this is that of Acts 2, and it says uh, the same thing, that he'll pour out his spirit, and that all shall prophesy. <clears throat> I wanted to hit this just a second, though. It says that they'll all do what? Prophesy. So what precedes prophecy? Repentance. Somebody hear me. Say amen. Every time. Now. That's another teaching, but let's move on. And he says, I'll show you wonders in heaven above. Now, here we know. We're in the, there's an outpouring of the Spirit. Then all of a sudden, he says, I'll show you wonders in heaven above. I'll show you signs in the earth beneath. And then he says, blood and fire, vapor of smoke. <clears throat> the sun shall be turned to what? Into darkness. And the moon into what? Blood. And I told you last week, every time you see the red blood moons, and, and, the, and, and this prophecy has not moved on. We're living in a what we call a parenthesis time when you study Scripture. We're living in what's called the day of grace. The day of grace was a secret hidden, Ephesians 3. The world didn't know about the day you and I are living in. God took this day, this mystery, this secret, and He stuck it right into the middle of the, of the prophecy of Joel. So now we're, we're seeing that we're living in a mystery and a secret. So every time the blood moons come, I'm thinking, okay, God, <laughs> here we go. So God pulls us right back up to the blood moons, and, and, and we have the eclipse of the sun. He pulls us right back up to it, and then God, nothing changes. That means, you've heard of God's grace, anybody heard of it? That means God has still holding this prophecy of Joel. It's just like I've told you. How many antichrists has there been? There's according to how many generations there's been. Satan has had an antichrist ready with each generation because he doesn't know the day and the hour. Oh, he's had one every time. But it's holding back. I'm sure he's just worrying Satan to death. He's probably thinking, where can I find one more? <laughs> because, because what happened, God holds it back. The prophet, you know God can do anything he wants to, right? It's a prophecy. It's going to fulfill but he's holding it back. He's got us stuck right in the middle in what's called grace. So we need to be urgent here. Right. We're in a parenthesis time. You have been given a time that you've been born again. You didn't do nothing by the grace of God poured out upon you and upon me. Now the grace of God, there's more to it than we're experiencing. Amen. It's because we've got to get into the love of God to get the kingdom of God on the road. And you can't sit around arguing over Scripture. Somebody hush, please. This thing's got to move. Amen. Love each other. Now, <clears throat> he says, Before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. Amen. And it shall come to pass, then in whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be what? Amen. Shall be saved. All right, now we know that we're here. Now let me move on. It is... Nine minutes after ten. Now, back in Joel chapter 2, one more uh, time, Joel calls for repentance. He then tells how, and this is what he says in Joel 2.13. This is, this is before the prophecy. Watch it now. Joel says, rend your hearts and not your garments. Amen. What he's saying is, don't do something outward, do something inward. Can, can you hear that? 
Jesus came on the earth because to deal with something inward before He's going to come outward. So He's saying, don't rend your clothes. Don't run around here in sackcloth and ashes. It's a heart deal. This is what Joel's saying here. Joel says that repentance can come just to be a show to get out of trouble and not truly from the heart. Then Joel tells them why to repent. Now this is good. God is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and full of love. He tells them, Here, let's repent. Here's what's going on. He tells them about the characteristics and attributes of God. It says here, uh, here he's quoting from the book of Exodus 34, 6, about how God forgave Israel of the golden calf. This is his reference of Joel back into the book of Exodus. Here, is, here it is. Now the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. Can somebody say the goodness of God? Listen, God's good. It's the goodness of God he was speaking of. Joel is referring back to the same God in Exodus, to the same God that's now. We find ourselves in Joel 2, right in the middle of this prophecy, so we can still stand before you and say, talk about the goodness of God. Amen. <laughs> now here he goes. So God was filled with passion for his land and had pity on his people. Then God said he was going to reverse the effects of this day of Israel and turn it... Uh, from judgment to salvation. <clears throat> that will, is what will happen even in the tribulation period. The things will turn from judgment and unto salvation. He is going to defeat the invaders, it says in Joel 2.20. Then he is going to restore the devastated land, and that's in <clears throat> the last part of Joel. Now when you get into Joel 3, Joel the, the last part of Joel 2 talks about God restoring Himself in fellowship with His people. That's what the outpouring of the Spirit's about. What God's promising in Joel 2 and the outpouring of the Spirit is that He will be among us. Amen. Can anybody hear that? We've got the Holy Spirit in and we've got the Holy Spirit out. Just because He's in doesn't exclude Him from being out. And just because he's out doesn't exclude him from getting in. Amen. Can somebody hear me? I've heard people say, well, the presence of God, it's, it's not. Well, it is. It's in here and it's here. It can, you can take it up with God. Yes, it is. All right. Now, Joel 2, 27 says this. God restores his divine presence among his people. His divine presence among his people. Well, how can His divine presence be among His people lest His people can identify with His love? The supernatural love of God. <clears throat> now, I'm going to change here to give a reflection of what's going on in John. Now, it says in those days, you know about John the Baptist. So John the Baptist came on and he was preaching in the wilderness saying what? Can you read it? Repent for the kingdom of heaven is what? Hand. At hand. It says, repent. Does repentance precede the kingdom? Yes. yes. If we're not seeing the kingdom, we don't have our repentance going on. Mm. When you got born again, guess what? You repented first. Yeah, that's right. Or you didn't get born again. Repentance precedes of the presence of God. <clears throat> and he says that he was a voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. We got this outpouring, this revival in Georgia. It's a revival, it's a, I believe it's a revival of John, the Baptist of repentance. And it makes me excited because I know it's a true visitation of the Lord. But it's exciting because it is a baptism of repentance. Well, we've had outpourings and we've had laughter, we've had this, we've had all these type of things, salvations. <clears throat> We've had all this going on. This is a revival of the baptism of repentance. Amen. Amen. <laughs> I'm excited Amen. because I know what precedes the coming of the Lord. Now, let's watch it. 
Here's the baptism of John. Matthew 3, 5. It says, Then Jerusalem was going out to him and all of Judea. Uh, go to the bottom of that one. Therefore, verse 8, bring forth fruit in keeping with what? With repentance. So John comes on the scene. He's got this baptism of repentance. We have a witness, not just Scripture. We are close to revival of the same thing of the baptism. It says in verse 9, Now do not suppose that you can say to yourselves that we have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that God is able from these stones to raise up children. You see that? To Abraham. And there is already laid at the root of the trees every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. As for me, I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with what? With what? Come on, y'all. He'll baptize you with what? Holy Spirit and fire. Holy Spirit and fire. Now, I don't know where y'all went to school, but when I went to school, fire burns. I don't care if it's from God or from where. Fire burns. Somehow or another, we've turned it into something fuzzy. Fire's hot. Okay? To be baptized in the Holy Spirit's fuzzy. To baptize in fire burns a fuzz off. Are you with me? So what does that mean? That means we're going to have to go. Th the fire is the repentance. It cleans us up, burns off everything that needs to be burned off. <clears throat> We're looking for a visitation of God. We've got to have first a baptism of the Holy Spirit, and there's going to be some fire. That's just the way it is. We can't get around it. Now, here's the core of the problem. I'm going to get to here. here here's the core of the problem. Now watch this. This is Deuteronomy 1. These are the words that Moses spoke to all Israel on this side of the Jordan in the wilderness, in the plain, <coughs> opposite uh, that name between Para, Topel, Lebanon, Hezeroth, and uh, Desiarnez or something. It is 11 days' journey. You see that? Here it is, Deuteronomy. Moses, the old timers, didn't make it into the promised land, just the children. So you read the book of Deuteronomy, he's commissioning the children, the next generation, to go into the promised land. Right. <clears throat> so he starts off in the book of Deuteronomy, writing it down, and Moses dies at the end of Deuteronomy, and then there they go. Well, he's telling them here, the words of Moses, he's saying, okay, <clears throat> he said it's an 11-day journey. Can somebody tell me how many years they were out there? <clears throat> they were out there 40 years. But he said here, Moses, in his own words, it was an 11-day journey. So something was happening. There was a lot of repentance needing to happen. Since they didn't, when they were ready to repent, it was too late. God said, no, I'm going to give it to the next generation. What you've got to understand, if God's telling us to repent, we've got to repent because it can be too late. That's just the way it is. We cannot enter into our promise, our promises, and our promised lands lest we repent, and there can come a time it's too cotton picking late. Now, that's the core of the problem. Now, I want you to see this. This is in, the, this is in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 1 through 6. <clears throat> now, it shall come to pass, when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God drives you. And you return... You see that? Which means to repent. To the Lord your God and obey His voice according to all that I command you today, you and your children, with all your heart and with all your soul. And the Lord your God will bring you back from captivity and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where the Lord your God has scattered you. Now here's my point. Moses shows them how to repent. Moses declared that you're going to get in the promised land, you're going to go into captivity. God already knew it. But when Moses did that, he said, it, you see verse 2, where I got it under, return. 
Now, he knew all that was going to happen, but he says you need to return. Now, I want you to see this, and I'm not going to stop till I get this one done. You got to see it. There's something that Israel did, and there's something God did. Repentance is a twofold thing. A lot of people are waiting around for God to do something. God's waiting around for you to do something. God will do what God does if you'll do what you're supposed to do. Is anybody with me? Does anybody want to get into the repentance mode here? Where we can see the kingdom of God move. Now watch this one right here. Here's the core of the problem. If any of you are driven <coughs> out to the farthest parts under heaven, and from there the Lord your God will gather you from there, and I'll bring you. Then the Lord your God will bring you to the land which your fathers possess, and you shall possess it. He will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers, and the Lord your God will circumcise. That means to change you. Circumcision here is to change your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul that you might live. Now here's the deal. In the beginning, in the garden, it was a heart problem. Heart problem's the problem. And God's got to get our heart problem straightened out so we can get on with other problems. But God so wanted our hearts that when Jesus died on the cross, His first order of business was the hearts of men. Well, we've got to see something. That's not to make you feel warm and fuzzy. It's so we can move on to the next stuff of God. we got to get the heart job done. Now watch this one. I'm just about ready to hush. <clears throat> this is God's solution to the problem. I'm going to show you how to repent here. It's in verses uh, 2 through 5 of Deuteronomy there. It shows that Israel had a work. Israel was to repent. They were to repent of redefining what God said was good and evil. Can you see that? It, Israel had something to do. Their job was to agree with God. And he says, And you return or repent to the Lord and your God and obey His what? So there's a repentance that takes place. Now watch this one. Now that's verses 2 through 5 in Deuteronomy. Verse 6 says this. Now here's God's work. We've got to work, and God's got to work. You say, well, Alan, I don't feel like repenting. <laughs> Repent anyway. I'm going to show you why. This is how you work out your salvation. If you're really interested in it, this is how you do it. Amen. God says you work at it. You repent. You know what to do, and you do what's right. You repent. You say, well, I don't feel like it. I don't feel convicted. That's okay. Repent anyway, because you have made a decision to repent. Now watch this one. Here's God's word. And the Lord your God will circumcise or change your heart. And you got to see this. We move and God moves. If you're wanting God to change your heart before you repent, it's backwards. you got to ante up something here. That's what Moses was telling Israel. You got to ante up something. You have left God. You have left His ways. You've redefined good and evil. <clears throat> Moses said, you got you to you repent. So what we do is we repent with the mind. And God promises to change your heart. Have you ever tried to change your life without repentance? Won't work. It's an operation. God does His part. Amen. When we repent and are obedient to God's Word, what He says, God then changes our heart. Amen. The heart change follows repentance. Amen. Don't say, Alan, I, I feel like changing, so I think of it. No, you do it because you read it. Don't redefine good and evil. Right here it is. Right. Do it. And God will change your heart. Amen. I promise it or this book's not telling the truth. Absolutely. Let's stand. Lord Jesus, we love you. I thank you, oh God, for your ways. And Lord God, you know our deal. If there's anything that I've said is not of you, 
I ask and pray, O oh God, that it would fall to the ground. But Lord Jesus, if I've said anything that's the truth of your word, how that we operate and we act and we move because you, your book says it. We repent because it's the right thing to do. We pray for the sick because it's the right thing to do. We give the gospel because it's the right thing to do. Help us repent, oh God. And we're trusting you to change our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.